so in that kind of hotel really near the airport kind of we one kind of way i think we uh we got some things done today we shivered and we shook to the sound of the jumbo jets of the human imagination taking everyone where they want to go but us we stay like a dirty pi waiting to see with the detritus the discarded waste paper packages tied up with string <laughs> These are some of my favorite things. <laughs> Okie dokie dog, daddy. All right. I'd like to have like Australian sports announcers do commentary on my day. Oh, look at this, mate. He's doing a crap underneath the seaweed. It's stupendous. <laughs> Wait, he's coming up short. No, he's got another. There you go. <laughs> Getting his pants back on, looking this way and that to make sure he isn't detected. <laughs> mm, yep, I like how he's cleaning up. Good job. And he's on his way, blithering, a little unbalanced and sad, but always moving forward. I like this guy. What do you think, Tony? Well, he's got a little ways to go till he gets into the professional way of things, but I'd say that uh, he's got a fine career out of him if he can find a way of perhaps not defecating so close to people. <laughs> right you are, Tony. But still, I admire his imagination in using that discarded PlayStation 5. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I gotta get going. Sorry. I just wanted people to know I was in a better mood. I both fear and secretly desire that day when the world kind of figures me out and knows that I deserve their utmost pity and concern. I want to have their deeply engorged vaginal lips wrapped around my homeless man's penis. I must have the penis of a homeless man. Right? It's always sniffing out free condoms. Oh, this one's perfectly good. You can wash it off when you get home. I use it to fuck my friend Ted. You know you're homeless when your best friend is called Shopping Cart Sam. He can fit more things into a shopping cart than any homeless person at the Homeless Person Olympics. They should have a Homeless Person Olympics. Get your shopping carts. If you can, tether them three in a row. Fill them up with as much shit you can in 15 minutes. And make the world an even dirtier place by doing it. Go. And then it's like some hang back and just wait for the other people to do all the work and then they beat them up and take their cards. 
You're watching the Homeless Personal Olympics. You give a guy that hasn't eaten in three weeks a meat and bologna sandwich, and he starts breaking it up into pieces and giving it to other homeless people. I always feed everyone else first. It's the homeless code. You find homeless people actually give food to other homeless people. I mean, it's like, holy shit. That's amazing. I wouldn't do it. I'd hold on to every scrap I could get. But then the alpha male, they need to be fed first, like the queen bee. Feed me first, everyone. I have homeless people feeding me. <laughs> like, Trust me, you want me strong. I can protect you. I give you something to do, don't I? I give you a reason, a purpose. I call myself Daddy Daddy Watkins. <laughs> kind of like Judge Watkins, but your daddy. <laughs> here, here, we have a little dispute. Let's see. Soapy Sam and Jittery Jane are fighting after what? A catheter. <laughs> They want to use it to shoot something up. Okay, look, both of you, you know how I solve all these problems. Give it to me, give it to me. Neither one of you are gonna shoot up until tomorrow. And then I'm gonna give you so much to shoot yourself up with. It'll be the last shooting up you ever do. In fact, we'll have a shoot up contest. The first one to OD wins. <laughs> That's the fun to overdose wins. <laughs> oh, look at Jittery Jane wins. She gets the catheter, but she's not even here. That's the way it goes, Soapy. You know the rules. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I did get a lot of free heroin. Yes, in a way. <laughs> of course, it cost Jittery Jane her life. But look at this, everyone. Do I not entertain you? Do I not turn our own suffering into a kind of sport? Do you not feel better now? Plus, there's more food to go around. You're right. You are our Lord. I come from that world out there that has tossed you aside and treated you like mere vermin. Burdens themselves, burdens. Born of burdens. Seventh generation's burdens. You tried to dissemble the magician's language and you felt even more burdensome. Internally, and until finally pushing a shopping cart around seemed like the only way to release yourself from the irons of the world's own lexicon. <laughs> Let me take you like little orphan children, little orphan Annies and Andies, sexually confused, emotionally confused, traumatized, abandoned, become like junker dogs, rifling through the trash of other people with happier lives than mine. <laughs> but now, tonight, I give you one time only performance by my alter ego, Mickey Mouse. <laughs> Hi there, everyone. Hi. You know, sometimes Disney himself had it difficult. You know what he did? He invited stray children into his laboratory and experimented on them. <laughs> I hope I never go to prison. Oh my, oh my, not there, not there. No, no, not there. <laughs> they never did Mickey Mouse. Even I think Elvis goes to prison. Don't point But Mickey Mouse, no, I don't think Mickey Mouse would be, he'd be inside the wall somewhere going, I'm gonna help them escape. They can use this rat excrement to fake a gastrointestinal disease. An ambulance will come and take them away. Then I'll run across the road in an opportune time and the ambulance will somersault. They will be knocked conscious. Everyone else will be knocked unconscious and then you can escape. Here, I'll put it in your discarded bologna sandwich. There you go. <laughs> And you have to wonder why I still don't have a job. <laughs> like, that's what this is. 
It's a chronicle. My grade fifth teacher told me to explain why I was going to be useless the rest of my life. And I said, you know what? I'm going to make some videos. I can't remember my grade three teacher. Oh my Lord, it's weird. I have all this recollection of all my teachers in grade school, but not all I know is that I didn't like her. But I, I never remember it. It's just like, I don't get it. Like, did I blank out an entire year? I kind of understand what kind of classroom I was in. I was leaving. I don't think anything bad happened. Like, what? How old was I? I would have been eight years old. What happened? How did I blank out an entire year of my life? I don't get it. I know I was really happy to be in grade four, Miss Vanderflyer, but grade three, nothing. I think she, I remember thinking that she was a substitute teacher, but she never went away, and she had bags under her eyes like a raccoon, you know? But I don't remember learning anything. I don't think it was a big learning year, even grade three, really. I mean, it was just, it was like a, I mean, I could have stayed home. I don't know. School is extremely inefficient. I mean, really. I just think it's awful how long they keep us in there just to keep us in a holding pattern. I said to my mom, you know, it's amazing. You know, you've got all these people live on here, all these children. But you never see you never see them. Like like 18, 19, 20, they're gone. You don't see them hanging out. They're not gonna walk down the street in parks and like, hey guys, I don't have a life. That's the last thing they want to do. When I get out of here, then I get to the city, they want to lose themselves in their lives. Right? They want to be free. They get jobs to be free. You know? It's freedom. Right? In the Western world, right? To grow up and get a job, relationships, freedom, freedom, freedom. And for a lot of people, like myself, other people, it's a, a sudden bout of clinical depression. Freedom with clinical depression. It's kind of an odd thing, isn't it? And then you think, why me? Why all this freedom? Why would you suddenly get depressed? Everyone's been so nice to you. Everyone's done so much work. You've worked so hard. You've been so good. And just out of the blue, boom, soft with depression. And you know, I had depression. No one ever found out why. I knew why. I could have told anyone, but nobody asked me. So I never developed an understanding commensurate with being asked. I can't give you evidence that any therapist I had ever asked me why I thought I was depressed or what was wrong. I mean, you got to think, I'm telling you now, that if people are depressed, something's wrong. If a 25-year-old is depressed, something's wrong. Five minutes with a, with a non-psychopathic person with an IQ over 60, you could have written an essay about what was wrong with my life or what had gone wrong with it, or what just showed signs that the stress that had caught up to me had gone back a long way. Repression, shyness, inhibitions, you know, fear, domestic issues, right? Everything that you could call some sort of social issue or um, failure to launch or delayed adolescence was basically just delayed suffering from all of the fairly understandable and overwhelming stresses that can affect different people in different ways. And we should be thankful that some of our children are more capable of succumbing to them. Because otherwise, how would you even know they're there? And even then you don't, because you don't listen to them. You know? And children suffer most from the things we don't know are there. And yet we want to protect them from everything. We can't protect them from the stuff in the darkness of our own minds. Because you can't just be middle class, you can't just be educated, you can't just be an adult, you can't just be civilized, you can't just be a proper mom, dad, worker, employee, Christian, worshiper, spiritual, atheist, anarchist, capitalist, you can't be any of these things, any of them. You'll never get enough fullness out of any relationship, and you might not even need to, unless what? What does it really mean to stand on two feet? to use both your eyes or your whole brain, to be truly independent, to be in the right place with all the types of relationships you were born with a natural orientation to, hunger for, and ability to grow in relationship to and hunger for, right? Knowing your importance, your responsibilities, all these things. Why should people go through this and yet not be able to see 
that their own children hunger for the most or are afraid of the most. Precisely because it is the most. And what is the most? Is the most well hidden by everything we do the most and know the most and love the most. Hides what hurts the most, what hates the most, and what terrifies the most. Terrorism is just the Western world. We don't even see it. We'd rather hunt down terrors in the Middle East than the terrors in our own homes. And it's not just the, the gluten or the laundry detergent. It's literally the things we don't see. The things we've endured, the things nobody saw, the things we did all by ourselves. We absorbed this shock. I did this. I live with this. Every difficult home has a mom and dad going, I did this, I live with this, I've endured this, I've done that, I'm a big person, I do my job. Right? Why are you crying? Why is this so hard for you? Don't you understand reality? Go ahead, do this, do that. And you wonder how the pain continues. Right? Because there's never any time to listen to it. I say if you form a family, prepare for your children to have something to say that needs to be therapy for the whole family. Get a family therapist on retainer as soon as you have sex with someone. That's what people need, right? Sex is just the beginning of your problems, right? You gotta prepare your children for a therapeutic way of life because the human race and white people have a huge glut of mental problems and things that they endure that they do not say. And 99% of them are okay with it because they've found the legal and legitimate ways of putting that shock onto other people. Where do you think all the bombs and bullets and gang shootings come from? All the little, little things that add up to all these other things, the stresses, the mental feels, the work, everything. People start to get their mind clear. They start to spend some solitary time they start to realize how difficult it is, and how mucky the world is, just in the frequency of the human mind. You start to want to physically be away from people. To me, a natural part of growing and healing as a human being is to have a physical need to be physically from, away from people. Look at how often children go to school in the farthest school they can find. They want to be, it's physically, physically far from their parents, or their home, or their town, as possible, right? The only thing that makes their life possible is their ability to die and be born again in another world. And so when they go to work, the only thing that makes their life possible is that eventually they can escape it by dying. And you base your relationships on that. It's all based on an insolvency that can only be paid if the currency of your debt is that of your own life by birth. And that's how the Western world is constructed. All right, we've done it two ways in one day.